What hooked me to telemedicine was just seeing the intention and the idea that we could access and give access to patients who may not get care, who may not feel safe coming somewhere, or they just can't get physically, geographically, they cannot get anywhere. But I saw it time and time again how that would improve their care. And then second, just being able to see patients at home and understand what actually goes on at home. How is their care? What is their home situation? What is going on that they don't know how to take this medication or understand how to put on their splint? Or, because we're emergency physicians, right? We don't see the follow-up, but seeing what a concussion patient goes through a week later. That, I will tell you, changed my practice in person because it gave me a great understanding of things that I hadn't in medicine. And so it was both great for patients, but also for me personally, it it made me a better doctor. This is the Visible Voices Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Risa E. Lewis. In today's episode, I'm delighted to bring you my conversation with Dr. Aditi Joshi. Aditi is a telehealth and digital health expert. She's a speaker, author, and an emergency medicine physician. We focus part of our discussion on her co-authored book, Telehealth Success, How to Thrive in the New Age of Remote Care. This is the ultimate guide for navigating the evolving landscape of remote healthcare. As an early adopter, Aditi was involved with telemedicine well before it exploded into the public consciousness. In 2013, she was Doctor on Demand's assistant medical director. She then led one of the largest telemedicine programs in the country as the medical director at Thomas Jefferson University. This is where we met. This is where I learned telemedicine, thanks to Aditi. And we even wrote a few articles together. Today, Aditi is the subject matter expert who helps healthcare organizations integrate technology into clinical practice. She also works on telehealth reimbursement, regulatory policy, and advocacy. Let's get to the conversation. You are certainly an early adopter of telehealth, and I was sort of an enthusiastic new user, a new educatee of you. And I was so impressed with how human-centered design focused the telehealth service was. And I'm wondering if you can maybe select your favorite aspect in your design process to make telehealth human-centric and user-friendly, be that the clinician or be that the patient or other. All of those aspects are really important. So I'll say that it's actually getting the feedback that it helps somebody tremendously, whatever it was. So when I was doing a lot of telemedicine clinical practice, just having patients say, oh, wow, I didn't realize that, or saying, I wouldn't have thought to do that, or you saved me a lot of time, or I was really worried about my child. All of that, especially when it was, I wouldn't have gone, or I didn't know where to go because I'm traveling, or I'm in a space that has no access to care. That really made a difference. And then on the flip side, I'll say with colleagues too, you know, we would do a lot of training, we get a lot of feedback. And I will say in the beginning, most clinicians, even some nowadays, don't really love it or they don't know how to use it to the highest degree. But coming at them and saying, okay, well, here's what we're going to do, right? We're not going to change your practice. We're going to help advance it. We want to make it better for you. The amount of times that I would hear feedback that, oh, what you're saying is reasonable. I get it. I see what you're trying to build here. And my patients do like it. That also on the other side, It made a difference and made me understand why we're doing this. There's some specific granular aspects of the service build that I particularly liked. Number one, language and translation services. When patients' first language is not English and or the ability for someone to join the telehealth visit, the call will say, such as someone who could be a translator or a family member, a caretaker. You have written about, talked about, taught about something called Website Manor. Can you tell the audience what Website Manor is? Absolutely. So Website Manor was the initial term we used for the way that you connect with patients. It is the tech term for Bedside Manor. But I'll say we've taken this step and this definition a bit further, and now we call it digital empathy because we want to make it a bit more open. So it's not always just over a video call or a phone call. How are we connecting? Are we using all our tech tools to make sure that patients feel that there is an empathetic, compassionate component to the way that we're engaging with them? And the entire world changed, you know, when telehealth became much bigger. Obviously, we were doing it before, but when it became much bigger during the pandemic, everybody was interacting over Zoom, over 
calls, whatever it was, they had to interact remotely. So some of this seems obvious, but the reality is it's not always obvious. How do you make sure that patients feel comfortable? It can be just easily how you set up the lighting, but it's also how do you speak? How do you allow for open-ended questions? How do you make someone feel that you're there for them? I say this all the time. It is so much easier in telehealth because there's no distractions. In an emergency department, people would be coming, they would be giving EKGs, there would be phone calls interrupting. There's no distraction here. But one of the things like you mentioned, it is really important to understand where that patient is and what they need. So an obvious one is translation services. I learned something really surprising. You're talking about a surprising thing I learned while writing the book is that most countries do not have any laws that require hospitals or physicians to supply a translator. This is a very U.S. thing, and it is a great thing. So we have that aspect. And so all of our telemedicine services had to allow and had to build something to allow a translator and interpreter to come in. Once somebody is in the visit, yes, we can supply that type of interpreter to make sure we're getting the right translation. But we need to get those communities to us, right? So if they only speak Spanish, they don't know anybody who uses these services, they're not going to trust it unless they see it written in Spanish, if they have somebody who knows it and has been interacting with in Spanish. So I think that's also really important to note. Yeah, that's a nice flag for another piece that you have talked about, written about, is advertising and make sure the messaging and the communication is available And we certainly saw that during COVID-19 to let people know they could do a telehealth visit rather than trying to go in person to a center or show up to the emergency department. You and I had a bit of fun in a piece that we wrote for the Philadelphia Inquirer entitled, A Primer, Doctors Offer Advice for How to Prepare for Your Telehealth Visit, Expert Opinion. And you really led the writing. And I think we had seven items. But one I will remember is... And this is sort of something that happens in the emergency department. And to your point, it's not so different via telehealth. We really often want to know what medications are you on. And so in the article, we told patients, you know, have your medicine bottles right there so that then you can show us your bottles or snap a picture. And I'm wondering if there's any other pieces of advice that have risen to the top for you that if someone's going to engage in a telehealth encounter, what would you tell them to prepare them? One of them is make sure you're in a secure location. We have become much more casual in the way that we're speaking just because of that way that we engage online. But this is still a medical encounter. And so you have to be in a safe place, a secure place so that we can have open discussions. And if you're not, we just want to make sure that you're safe. And so don't call us from a restaurant or while you're driving. This seems obvious, but it seems one that tends to have to be said over and over. And then, you know, come with your questions or make sure that all your questions are answered. Now, on the clinician side, I always do tell people, you know, really make sure that all the questions a patient wants to ask are being addressed. Give them room to have time. But as a patient also, don't be afraid to ask and make sure that all of them are answered because it's hard to jump back into a call. You know, if you're sitting in a clinic, you can sit there a while and be like, oh, wait, I need to ask another question. But it's a little bit harder in telemedicine. So don't be afraid to do that. And I do think that part of the change and the shift in culture making it a bit more casual or at least much more informal is probably helping people feel a bit more comfortable asking their physicians questions. And that's the way it should be. We want you to have that information. And so I think that's really one of the biggest things. So you have been in this space for over a decade. And I would say over the last five years, you have really put this pen to paper, not only with the book, but also with articles. In 2020, you led the writing of a few key pieces where you really described what is telehealth, what is the role telehealth is playing and can play in COVID-19, and also what it's doing for patient care in terms of really safe triage. So thank you for bringing those up and also to my writing team. I had some great co-authors, including yourself. I'll say that what we were trying to accomplish, and I think we did, was basically give examples of how this works and how it can be done safely. A lot of what happened during the pandemic was, it was an emergency situation, so people had to build things very quickly. And unfortunately, in those times, sometimes you implement it and it's not something that you can hold onto forever. And so you have two problems. One, a program that doesn't work well when it's not an emergency situation. And then two, if it didn't help your clinicians have an easy time of it, your clinicians are not going to want to do it. 
they're going to want to go back to the way things are normal. And so we wanted to demonstrate that you could do this in a way that was safe. So we talked about, obviously, it will help you with making sure that there are ways to keep your emergency room running or your clinics running in the future. And that also it can help make sure that uh, your clinicians are happy if you just think it through. I have a really great story. So when I was at Health, I was at a recently at a conference and there was a speaker who was talking about the recent hurricane. And he said that when he was uh, tasked by his health system to actually build out a way to mitigate when things happen in emergencies, what they were trying to do and they told him to do was initially try to invest in the emergency department. But he said, that doesn't make sense to me. So what he actually did and is relevant to this paper is that he made a telehealth network. He made a network of telehealth. And so he, what he did is figured out ways that in emergency disaster situations, they can make sure they had connection. They had different places for patients to go for care. So when this hurricane happened, yes, it was a disaster. It's going to take years to recover. But he said that he had numerous points of care for patients rather than just one. And I found that brilliant because that is what you want to learn from the pandemic and what we were trying to get across. And it was gratifying to hear that story, just to know that all of us are trying to build the right thing now. So as I mentioned, you've been doing this for over a decade. What was your first telehealth experience as a clinician? Oh, wow. So when I first started, it was very few people were doing it and there were definitely no patients. I had joined a startup and we were really doing this tele-urgent care. So things that were mostly seen in urgent cares, we were doing on telemedicine. My first shift, I was uh, scheduled for, I think, 12 hours, 10 or 12 hours. I had one patient. <laughs> so you can imagine, it was just, it was, it was not very busy. So that's really what it started out with. A lot of it was not busy at all, trying to figure out how do we do this. Within two years, I was very busy. I think on a 12-hour shift, I could see between 60 to 70 patients. So it did change. But yes, the beginning, pretty slow. <laughs> what hooked you? What made you say, I think there's something to this thing called telehealth? The reason I had first joined that startup was I had burnout at a very busy emergency department. And so I didn't want a full-time emergency medicine job. So I had looked around and I found a company doing this and I joined it just trying to learn about it really. And I was still doing emergency medicine, but I did cut down my shifts and learned about it. But I'll say what hooked me because that's not going to keep you, right? Burnout is not a reason to join something and it will not keep you interested in a topic. So I want to say that very clearly. But what hooked me to telemedicine was just seeing the intention and the idea that we could access and give access to patients who may not get care, who may not feel safe coming somewhere, or they just can't get physically, geographically, they cannot get anywhere. But I saw it time and time again, how that would improve their care. And then second, just being able to see patients at home and understand what actually goes on at home. How is their care? What is their home situation? What is going on that they don't know how to take this medication or understand how to put on their splint? Or, because we're emergency physicians, right? We don't see the follow-up, but seeing what a concussion patient goes through a week later. That, I will tell you, changed my practice in person because it gave me a great understanding of things that I hadn't in medicine. And so it was both great for patients, but also for me personally, it, it made me a better doctor. You recently tagged on LinkedIn a summary of a report from the RAND Foundation. I'm going to read a bit from that, and I'd love your reflection of where we are with reimbursement for telehealth services. Telehealth faces an uncertain future. Without congressional action, Broad reimbursement for telehealth in Medicare will expire at the end of 2024. Physicians and health systems have asked Congress to craft permanent policy. They argue that without a signal that telehealth will be available permanently, clinicians will not make the necessary investments to optimize these services. In other words, telehealth cannot deliver on its promise to improve access and quality if Congress does not commit. The reality is... These flexibilities that came out during the pandemic that allowed for bigger reimbursement, they do keep getting extended, but they won't and they haven't created this as a permanent law, permanent payment. There are a number of reasons for that that are too much to get into, but you know there is the disconnect between people like myself who work in telehealth and we're watching and work in reimbursement also. We know that these flexibilities are going to come through, but if you're somebody who is not really paying attention, you're really just building a hybrid practice or you're working in telemedicine or you're a health system, 
you can't always rely on that. And so it's going to limit how much investment that people are doing. This really is going to be a problem for those who want to build bigger programs, who don't have the grant money or the budget or a leader who wants them to do it. And we can talk about how CMS has been very proactive in telehealth since 2016. They have been. However, it isn't going to be a signal to everybody until they make it permanent. I wish they would because I know they want to. This is one of the few bipartisan accepted light issues in our country. Shocking, but it's true. Everybody loves telemedicine. And so it would be great if they did do that. For people that are like, what is the right term or what's the difference between telehealth, telehealth care, telemedicine? What's your response? Yeah, great question. I use telehealth more often because it's a broader term. So telemedicine, I consider, is the actual virtual encounter, the medical portion of it. Me and the patient, me and what tech I'm using, gathering the data, the remote data of their healthcare needs or vital signs, et cetera. Telehealth is much broader, so it includes all of the medical portion, but it also includes the regulation, the compliance, all the technology and the laws that go around it. So I use telehealth more often, but telemedicine is the actual medical portion. So I will sometimes use it if I'm talking about that, or it'll just be because I forgot. (laughs) (laughs) So I want to pivot a little bit and talk about remote patient monitoring. And you and I have been really excited about this, me, because I come from the ultrasound world. And for years, I really wanted to design a study that included ultrasound. And for audience members, you're wondering what I'm talking about. Think about the automatic external defibrillator at the airport. Think about the blood pressure cuff at the drugstore. Think about your own home monitoring equipment. Say you're a diabetic and you're checking your glucose. So we're very close to being able to have, I think, ultrasound equipment at home where people can perform their own ultrasounds. So in 2023, we published a study in POCUS Journal. It was entitled, Can Untrained Patients Perform Their Own Skin and Soft Tissue Ultrasound Examination by Teleguidance? In other words, this is a pilot study, 20 volunteers. They were at their internal medicine clinic appointment. They said, sure, I'll be a part of your study. They confirmed that they had no ultrasound experience, no medical knowledge, and they were teleguided to perform their own ultrasound. What the study found is the ultrasound examinations that these patients performed on themselves were acceptable and interpretable. So someone can have an ultrasound machine, be guided and told how to move the probe, get images that then the clinician can interpret and integrate into their patient care. Thoughts? So I love this study and remote patient monitoring or RPM, you'll hear that a lot, RPM or RTM, you actually find that this is going to be the next step, right? So telemedicine, people just being on video with their doctor, it's very limiting, right? We want to build upon that. And so what you want are the devices. You want the data from the devices. What's actually happening at home with patients? And so I think it's more obvious for patients to think through blood pressure or blood glucose because we have those and we're used to doing that. But what I love about the ultrasound study we did is that we proved that there are things that seem to be complicated and need to be done by physicians or trained ultrasound technicians, but we can actually guide them to use it so we can get that information at home. I think it's a good thing for us to learn about ourselves and what is necessary, right? And also it gives us a complete expansion of what we can diagnose. I mean, people at home with ultrasound under guidance, we can look at their abdomen, their chest. I mean, how much work could we do? How much time could we save them if we were able to do that? It's going to be a new skill. People get a lot of afraid that it's going to take our jobs away, but really it's not. It's going to allow us new skills because we'll have to learn how do we tell a guide? How do we take that data and use it properly? Yeah. I think it's really patient-centered. And you can think about even clinician-centered. The VA has rolled out studies for patients that get fluid in their lungs, congestive heart failure, having them go home with a handheld ultrasound, telling them where to put it on their chest to see if there's the equivalent of fluid in the lungs. So no need to have an unnecessary patient care visit. Oh, I love that. I want to ask you about your voice. This podcast is called The Visible Voices. When did you realize you had a voice? When did you start using that voice in this telehealth, telemedicine, tech space? There was a lot of years where I didn't think I had any voice or a voice that I knew no one wanted to hear. It became more apparent during the pandemic when people were reaching out wanting information that, yes, people want the information. I also like to think that 
when I talk about my voice or being a visible voice, that it's really most important to me that it's used for a purpose that is higher than just me, myself. And so I really try to keep that in mind because otherwise you get stuck in ego battles and I'm not really interested in that. What I'm really interested in is why I'm doing this. But that's something you have to learn because once you realize that, once I internalize that, I was like, well, then you can't keep quiet. Even if nobody wants to hear it, even if you think your voice is not someone that's visible, the reality is it doesn't matter. You have to keep speaking up if it's something you know about, that's something that's important, something that's necessary for patients or my colleagues and uh, colleague physicians who need advocacy as well in this developing world in digital medicine. So I think it was for two things. It was just really getting past the imposter syndrome that we all tend to have. And then two, realizing what I want to use it for. And that really made it much more obvious to me. And I would probably say that I'm still building up on it, but it became more obvious during the pandemic. What's next for Dr. Aditi Joshi? Well, I just took a new position. I am the executive director of telehealth.org. We acquired it from a wonderful founder who had been running it for 30 years. 30 years she's been there having telehealth.org, if you can believe it. And so from there, uh, we're trying to build it out. Uh, It is a great resource for mental health and behavioral health. We're going to take it and expand it to physical medicine. And uh, we'll see where that leads. And as usual, I'm doing my consulting and speaking work as well, trying to build out not just telehealth for the international and global world, but I really do a lot of work in RPM and RTM and some virtual reality, which I find very interesting. Your legacy. My legacy, I would be gratified to find out that whatever was built, whatever telemedicine, digital innovations, really improved access for people and gave patients tools so that they had a better idea about their healthcare and they felt safer going to the doctor and having medical encounters. That would be one. And then two, for my colleagues out there who are worried about how innovations are going to affect their career, how it's going to worsen their burnout or improve it or not. I want them to feel that there is someone advocating for them because in the end, I will always advocate to make sure that it isn't overwhelming for all of our colleagues who are going in and doing day in, day out, all of the clinical work that is necessary. So if I could do two of those things or at least add to it, I would feel that that would be a good career. The Risa Wrap-Up. Special thanks to Dr. Aditi Joshi for joining me in conversation. It was a delight to speak with a telemedicine subject matter expert. Audience, I want to describe two acts that Congress has passed related to telemedicine. In 2021, Congress passed the Broadband for All Initiative. This allocated $65 billion for broadband improvements and aimed to expand broadband access, therefore supporting more reliable telehealth connections, making it easier for patients in specifically rural areas to connect with healthcare workers remotely. In 2023, Congress passed the Connect for Health Act. That's actually an acronym, creating opportunities now for necessary and effective care technologies, Connect. This promotes telehealth expansion by reducing the geographic and service restrictions that limit its current reach. This bill also expands coverage of telehealth services under Medicare, allowing the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that's CMS, to generally waive coverage restrictions, particularly during any public health emergency. And number three is a request. Dr. Joshi referred to it. I'm going to refer to it now. Please, 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 please do not drive when you join your telehealth medical appointment. That's all I have for you this week, audience. See you next time. The Visible Voices podcast amplifies voices in the healthcare, equity, and current trends spaces. We are a production of the People's Media Network. Our team includes Dr. Giuliano DePorto and me, Dr. Risa E. Lewis. Please find me through my website and on social media, Risa E. Lewis, MD, or through the podcast, thevisiblevoicespodcast.com. Please give us a five-star rating on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, please be sure to share the show with a friend. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the institution with which they are affiliated or identified. Information herein should never be used as a substitute for clinical judgment or for medical advice.